Hello everybody and welcome to the cooperative installment of the 2020 Shucks preview videos. And these might look like normal shut up and sit down reviews, they are not that. Instead, in a year where publishers can't get to conventions to demo their games because of a little thing called COVID, we're going to be demoing their games for them. So, for all the games in this video, they might look cool, they might look exciting, I hope so, but I've not played any of them. Shut up and sit down doesn't recommend them, we're just going to show you uh, what they're about. And starting with the seventh Citadel, and this is a heck of an exciting thing. This is a huge Kickstarter game. It's also the sequel to a game called The Seventh Continent, which was inspired by the fighting fantasy books. If you imagine ripping all the pages out of that book and using those pages as cards, you get somewhere close to what that game plays like. Seventh Citadel, as a sequel, has lots of the same uh, kind of mechanics, but also a bunch of extra stuff, including a giant map that slots cards in, a booklet determining the progress of your citadel, which you'll be building and expanding as the campaign goes on, because, oh yes, this isn't a game made up of lots of little games, it's a game made up of lots of scenarios that together tell a story with progression and your character leveling up and your citadel getting bigger, but... I think I'm getting overexcited. I should just give you some basics as to how this game works. What I've got set up in front of me is a two-player game. We have one player here and another player here, and I've set up something like a scenario in progress. Also, before we get any further, must stress, as you can see by the big word, prototype from there. This is a prototype. None of these components are final, and when you see B-roll of the map later, you'll see it's all in French. Your copy will not be all in French, unless you're French. I can't promise that, but I can speculate. Um, so, the centerpiece of the game is this kind of map here. You're going to be running your characters around different areas, but as you look, you can see that green numbered pointers are gonna show how you build onwards and outwards from this map. So, what I've got set up here, you can see some locations here, which together sort of form a kind of picture of where we are, and then off to the side, you can see events. But the really important thing to look for are these little white squares, okay? Because every white square you can see symbolizes an action that you can spend your turn taking. Because your turn in Seventh Citadel is as simple as doing one action. So with the board set up here, we've got uh, a man who's trapped under some stones up here. He could be rescued or you could try and rescue him for an action. You've got a locked door here. You could try and get through that for an action. There's this charming looking jelly man down here. We could go and brawl with him to try and clear the way. And actually, let me demonstrate how that works. If Arthur here was to go and fight and use the card system in Seventh Citadel to overcome this monster, you can see there that the result of success would be to swap to the gold version of this card. This is card number 26. So if we look through this giant deck of cards for golden number 26, we can say to that little jelly monster, get out of town, I've defeated you, and replace it with 26. And look, that's a continuation of this corridor and then you've got all these new numbers on the new card showing new actions you can take. You see how it's like a choose your own adventure book? Rather than, you know, turning to page 26 if you want to knock down the door, rather all the different kind of pages you could turn to are on the map in a sort of expanding geography of choice and possibilities, which is very exciting. Also, I should have led with this, also very exciting to me is the setting of Seventh Citadel, which let's jump to the world map to add some color while I talk about this. The world of Seven Citadel is best described as a post-apocalyptic fantasy world. And actually, reading the backstory for it is the most I've enjoyed reading the backstory of a fantasy game for quite some time. Some kind of being is controlling horrible worms that tunnel beneath the ground in this world, and a force known as the Necro-Druids, who are kind of the good guys, but really, who knows, um, have, yeah, have used dark sort of blood magic to create powerful plants that root with roots that dig into the earth to combat the worms that are controlled by an even bigger bad below. And you don't play necro druids. You don't play rebels fighting either force. You in fact play gardeners who are prisoners of the necro druids, tending their gardens and helping the bad guys to fight the bigger bad guys. It's all bad, there's a lot of bad stuff going on, but mostly I find it really interesting and evocative and it plays with a lot of imagery and words that I don't always see in fantasy. It reminds me a little bit of The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin, though that might be me being uh, slightly generous. 
Um, one cool thing about this map that you'll see though, it's actually got lots of kind of plastic envelopes. And that is because as you discover and reveal cards, this is not a relevant card, uh, but you'll be able to slot and slide them in, permanently changing this map of yours. Uh, so that is super neat. It reminds me a bit of how Gloomhaven is changing uh, for Frosthaven. You know, it's taking the foundations of Gloomhaven then adding a city building element. Seventh Citadel is much the same thing. Similar game mechanics to uh, Seventh Continent with you exploring a map and trying to overcome obstacles. But like Frosthaven now, you've got a town you're building. This is kind of the Citadel of Seventh Citadel and I've gotten distracted and I'll talk about how the action card mechanic works later, how you really play the game. But uh, as long as I'm talking about world building and persistent elements, BAM! BAM! <laughs> My arm was almost not long enough there. This giant thing, as you play the campaign, is going to track all of the persistent elements. You've got buildings you can build, you've got a kind of enormous skill web you can progress through to unlock all kinds of different stuff like better actions or better buildings. You've got a map that you can annotate, I love that, it's just a map that you can draw things on as little reminders. Another thing tracking your side quests and then there's a little reference on the back. There's so much here and if you're like me and uh, the best bit of, I don't know, say Kingdom Death Monster was maintaining your town, you know that's gonna be exciting. Um, final thing I should probably walk you through in this very quick overview of how the game plays is how you actually play the game. That'd be good quins, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> so um, let's focus on one character, okay? So here we've got Arthen. Each character display is gonna be made up of their character card showing any special traits they have. A dial, obviously this is a prototype, but it's gonna show how much life and stamina you have. You've got a hand which refers to, okay, this is your deck and you're going to be customizing it. You'll be able to pick certain cards from your deck before each scenario to go in front of you as skills, as sort of permanent ways to change your character, make them better or worse at certain things. So you've got your skills and then you've got items and other stuff you'll collect during the mission. For example, Arthur, midway into this introductory scenario has found some hope. That's nice. Denholm over here has no hope, but I'm, I won't get distracted. Then the way actions work is you'll see these little equations next to a lot of skill checks. The symbol in the white square is the kind of check it is, whether that's strength or fighting or observation or lock picking. The blue is how many cards you must draw from your action deck at minimum, and the gold is how many successes you need to progress. So with this guy here who's trapped under some stone, if we were to try and solve this as Arthen, we need at least three successes. Arthen does not have any skills relating to sort of brawn or strength in the way that we've built her. So we know we have to draw at least two cards, but we need three successes, so maybe let's draw a couple more. And then after that, you're gonna flip them and see that I have uh, one and a half. Half and a half, oh, hang on, look, 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 look. And then by arranging the cards, I can hopefully get enough stars. Except I actually can't, that looks to me like, uh, th I don't, that looks to me like three stars. So that would be an example of a failed check. Um, so you might ask yourself, Quince, why didn't you choose to draw more cards to make sure you passed? Bea Kuaz, every time this deck runs out, you're gonna lose five life points. And this is also how the game uh, scales for multiple players. Uh, how many people you're playing with, you just divide 30 life points across all of the characters uh, for the scenario. So for example, if you're playing by yourself, you're gonna have one beefy person with 30 life points. In a two player game, they both have 15 and so on. So that's how the game is balanced. So there you have it. That's a kind of whistle stop tour of the prototype version of Seventh Citadel, a game of uh, simple rules, well, compared to some uh, sort of campaign games you can play. Exploration, where you're constantly turning over new cards and seeing new things. I think exploration is the word that I would use. I would get excited about the 7th Citadel if your favorite part of board games is flipping open a book to a passage to reveal a new fragment of story, or flipping over new cards. It's hard to take your turn in 7th Citadel without flipping over one of the cards in its giant decks. I mean, this, this? is just the introductory scenario, which is very small and very short. So yeah, this is an epic experience, an epic choose your own adventure for one to four players. It's probably absolutely fabulous solo. And of course, entirely cooperative, like everything you see in this video. So without further ado, let's move on to the next game. All right, next up, me and my fashionable shirt are going to be guiding you through Aliens, another glorious day in the core, an official licensed game of 
the Aliens movies, obviously. Yeah. Um, but more excitingly, it is published by Gale Force 9, a company that always punch above their weight when it comes to licensed games. If anyone's ever played their licensed game of the Spartacus TV series, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, they also publish the game of uh, the official Firefly board game, which is quite well liked. Um, but what we have here is a campaign game that takes you through the events of the movie Aliens. And we've also got a couple of expansions. There is a lot to get through with this one. So I'm going to be going, giving you a super quick whistle stop tour of how you play the game. Then I'm going to quickly blitz you through some of the campaign stuff. And finally, I'll talk about what you can get in the expansions because there is so much to cover here, which isn't to say this is a big expensive box. Rather, it's just a Gale Force 9 game, which is to say there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of fun stuff. There's a lot of pushing the envelope happening here. And I don't want to leave uh, much of it on the floor. Uh, on the sort of metaphorical cutting room floor of this little video. So, uh, what do we have here? Well, this is a cooperative game in which players will choose one of the characters from the Aliens movies uh, to be, and all of, but you will play with everybody. Uh, even if there's just two players or one of you, you're not going to be limited to only having two of characters from the Aliens movie. You're always going to have a full six people in your campaign. It's just that the people you don't choose to play are flipped over to their grunt side, which has lower stats and no special rules to keep the game smooth and simple, while the characters that you choose to play will be their hero mode, which is stronger, special rules. Um, also, with the campaign styles, you're going to equip everyone with everything you want. I've given Vasquez here a smart gun, and Frost has some grenades, and pulse rifles were handed out like, you know, Halloween candy to everyone else. Um, you have a whole deck of equipment here, and just like in the movies, the game says, equip yourselves with whatever you want, with the subtext being, it's not gonna save you. Um, there's also some really cool stuff going on with this deck that I will get to later. Goodness me, there's lots to cover. So, a very simple way to describe uh, the game is it's very similar to Imperial Assault crossed with Space Hulk, crossed with Flam Rouge, the bicycle racing game, if you can believe that. Um, on your turn, you're going to do a bunch of stuff, but at, at its absolute simplest, on your turn in this game, you get to do two actions, okay? Um, one action might be to move. In this beginning mission of the campaign that I've set up, we're looking for Newt. We think she's in here. So I might, for my first action, move Vasquez towards this room. One, two, three, four. That's an action, just moving up to your speed value. Now, uh, if you could see something, like let's imagine there was an alien here, another action would be to shoot. And shooting is super simple. You're going to grab one of these 10-sided uh, marine dice, and you're going to try and roll lower than whatever number is shown on your aim dial. Okay? And different characters obviously have aim dials that are higher or lower. Your aim dial resets at the beginning of your turn, but every time you take a shot, it's gonna go down. You're going to uh, roll the dice, and if you get equal to or under your aim, that alien is killed. Blam! Uh, however, then you're gonna lower the aim dial, so the more shots you take in one turn, uh, the harder it's gonna be to hit anything. That's going to be a real problem because when aliens rush up to you after all the heroes have taken their turn and it's time for the aliens to move, uh, you get one chance to shoot them before uh, they attack you and clobber you into unconsciousness and possibly capture you, which is an interesting twist in this campaign. Uh, heroes can be captured and then you as a group have to decide whether to go on an entirely additional mission to try and uh, get your friends back, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, yes, on your turn, two actions, you can move, you can shoot, you can barricade doors using these nifty barricade tokens, which, uh, it sounds a lot more effective than it is. You know, the aliens are very clearly designed in this game to be scary and will half, literally 50% of the time, just clobber through barricades as if they were nothing. So what am I forgetting? Uh, you've got two actions on your turn. You can move, you can shoot, you can barricade, you can interact with things, and you can rest. So, let me talk about the Endurance deck a little bit. This is what I say when I talk about this being similar to Flam Rouge, okay? So, lots of actions in the game will cost things. If you want to equip a card from your hand, um, then you can do that, but you might have to exhaust some cards. If you want to use the super cool smart gun from the movies, that's great, but it's bulky and heavy and it's going to tire you out. So, using that, it's going to exhaust you too. Now, what you're doing here is uh, taking the deck that you draw cards and events from, and you are taking cards out and putting them in this exhaust pile. And cards that are in the exhaust pile can't be drawn. In fact, they exist in this kind of limbo state between cards you can draw and use and cards that are removed from the game. 
And if your entire draw pile ends up in the exhaust pile, and you still need to continue exhausting cards and tiring out your marines with all of these cool actions you're doing, cards from the exhaust will go into the discard. Now, discarded cards are cool because they're not just removed from the game. They are potentially removed from the campaign. Because, and I love this, is the kind of thematic flavor that Gale Force 9 is so good at. As your characters get tired between missions, I mean, if you've seen the movie, you'll know there's no like week or month long break for them to like get themselves back together. They're getting more injured and tired and exhausted, all their equipment's running out, and that is modeled by this exhaustion deck. I'm really very impressed by it. For a game, for a licensed game, this is a complicated, involved, interesting mechanic, like something out of Pandemic Legacy. Um, so basically, yes, you want to complete each mission, but you want to do so while being a, as not exhausted as possible. So yes, you could equip everybody with smart guns and huge grenades and lumber into missions carrying all this gear. But that might not be a good idea because you're going to get tired very, very quickly. And you're going to go into mission two with a draw deck that might be half the size that it should be. And that's going to mean you're going to get exhausted even faster, which means you'll probably go into the final mission with almost no draw pile at all. Um, it's, it's profoundly interesting. I could easily talk for five minutes just about this deck, but we do not have time for that. I'm looking at the clock. Uh, so, what else is there to say? Well, let me talk to you a little bit about how the aliens move, because it's just incredibly simple. Um, and we've got some lovely thematic flavor going on with these blip tokens, okay? So, as aliens spawn, which happens every turn, you're gonna be grabbing these blip tokens and placing them on these spawn points, okay? Now, once Marines see, uh, if Marines see them, you immediately flip them over and replace them with alien miniatures. But, as long as Marines don't see them, just like in the movies, all of these blip tokens are gonna be moving towards the Marines. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the aliens don't know how many aliens those blips represent. If you've not seen the movie, the alien movies are defined by this object, which is a motion tracker, depicted on the back of these cards, um, and you can see blips moving towards you, but you don't really know how many aliens are coming towards you, or what aliens are coming towards you. This is a mechanic that got, from the movie, that got ripped off by a Games Workshop game called Space Hulk, and now I am thrilled to say it is back in an aliens board game. Uh, so what happens is that when a blip rounds the corner, one, two, three, four, five, and it can be seen by Marines, you're then gonna flip it over, and you're going to reveal a number, which is how many aliens that is, okay? So, and that works uh, incredibly simply. All you do is you place, if it's a one, an alien miniature there. And if it's a number greater than one, you're gonna take these alien tokens. Let's imagine we drew a four, which is a big old, big old swarm of aliens. We're gonna take three of these alien markers and put them on top of the miniature, which is number four. And in terms of rules, it acts exactly like one alien. There's nothing complicated here. It's gonna move like as if it was one alien. It's gonna attack like it was one alien, but it's gonna get a little bonus to its attack for every alien in the swarm. And definitely more importantly, every time you shoot it and kill it, you guessed it, you don't kill that alien. You just remove one of the aliens from the swarm. Um, overall, the aliens in this game are designed with two things in mind that I really like. First off, they are incredibly simple to operate. As anyone who's played a co-op game with all kinds of miniatures and guns will know, it is paramount that the aliens that you have to operate AI for, well, I say aliens, aliens or goblins or whatever else you're playing, um, need to be simple. If you've got, I've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight miniatures to move after all the Marines have moved. I don't want it to be some complicated multi-step flowchart. I just want to do the thing. And in this case, it's incredibly simple. Everything just moves six spaces towards you and then attacks if it can. That's it. You, however, uh, do get a chance to shoot just before uh, you are attacked. In fact, the way this works is they've made it as tense as possible. I'm gonna go over time on this video, but that's only because I like this game so much. It's incredibly tense. Aliens will run up to you, and everyone that can see that alien gets one free shot to kill it, only though the moment before it attacks and either knocks someone down or captures them or kills them. Um, so the game says, yeah, we will give you a chance to survive, but we will only give it to you the very instant before a Marine gets clobbered. Um, so that is a kind of basic overview of the game. It, if you have played Descent or Imperial Assault, it will be instantly familiar, but it is designed from the ground up to be more, um, more of a spooky game, more of a horror game. The aliens in this are scary and as you'd expect from all of the campaign objectives that come with the base set, 
Um, you're not often just trying to kill aliens. You're trying to survive or get somewhere. Um, and there's the sense that the aliens outnumber you, you're outgunned, you're, uh, you're, you're being predated on, basically. Whew, okay, so that's the absolute basics. Now, what I will talk about with the campaign that is really neat is that in addition to this exhaustion deck, which is gonna run out between missions, if one of these six characters in your campaign dies, they are dead. They don't come back in a later campaign stop. If one of your Marines gets captured and dragged away to become food for a facehugger, you have to make the decision as a group whether to play an entirely additional mission just to try and get those Marines back. This is a campaign that plays for keeps. Um, which I find really interesting. This isn't some 20 mission campaign which you're going to diligently slog your way through. No, the, by default, while there are some extra missions your group can choose to play, the campaign in this is three missions long and it's hard. So the idea is that rather than diligently making your way through some long legacy game, this is a mission, this is a campaign you'll try, probably fail at and then try again. Um, which I think is definitely the correct choice for an accessible licensed game. But if you want to make the campaign bigger, we do have some expansions here that I find quite exciting. Uh, we have the Ultimate Badasses expansion, which had six optional marines for you to swap in and out with the six marines that come in the base set. Also, Ultimate Badasses adds some experience cards. So every time you complete a mission, everyone can give their character some experience and level them up as if you were playing an online MMO. Yes, that's right, an online, massively multiplayer online game. So yes, this adds some more character customization and character development. Whereas get away from her, you be asterisk, asterisk, asterisk H, which I think stands for branch. Um, that is going to add, uh, obviously, because how could they turn it down? Ah, everything's fallen over. Oh no, Ripley, save me. Uh, we have got a queen alien miniature. We have Ripley in the cargo, the forklift suit. Uh, we have some new heroes, including exactly one half of a cool android. And we have some additional missions for you to mix and match into the campaign. Remember I said before that uh, this is a campaign that you would play through several times because it is difficult? Uh, the Get Away From Her You Branch expansion is going to add optional missions for you uh, to play within the campaign. So as you go through this campaign again, it's going to have more color, more options, more flavor. Uh, and more queens, and I mean that in both senses of the word. So, uh, I definitely overran on that one, but only because, well, frankly, I think Gale Force 9 deserve it. This is a game which, uh, I don't know. I, I, in my job, I'm so often exposed to board game publishers making scratch by uh, doing the official board games of licensed games. And I very rarely like those interpretations as much as what Gale Force 9 do. Uh, of course, all of this is just first impressions because as with all of the games in this video series, I have not played this, um, but I would be excited to play Aliens Another Glorious Day in the Core. Let's see what the next game is. This large, stately black box is Legendary, a James Bond deck building game, a one to five player co-op deck builder where you will be taking on a kaleidoscope of exciting James Bond films. There are four of them in the box and you will play through each one as an individual scenario with different villains and schemes and allies to recruit every single time. As with all deck builders, each player will have their own deck of cards that they'll add to over the course of the game and use it to recruit new agents and tackle problems on each turn. Before each game, you will pick a scenario. Here, we're just about to start a game of Goldfinger, and you can see the man himself right here. This slot is reserved for the mastermind that you're playing against on any given mission, not controlled by the player, mind, but a representative for the game itself. And just above him, you can see his scheme, Operation Grand Slam. Now, there's a bunch of information on both of these cards that pertains to exactly how they're going to twist your game in a horrible way, but we'll get to that a little later. Essentially, on each turn, every player will take the following three actions. They will turn over a card from the evil deck, then they will play the cards in their hand in whatever order they so wish, and then they will draw up a hand of new cards and pass on to the next player. The first step is effectively the mastermind's turn. You'll draw cards from the deck that show new dangers or missions arriving into play. 
Each time that you draw one of these cards, you'll slide everything up across this conveyor belt of doom. And if you were to ever play something that would cause the last card to slide off the edge, then that will cause a bad thing to happen. If it's a mission, it will increase the danger level by the amount shown on top of the card. This one's one, so we put it up to one. And if it ever reaches the goal, which is five for this mission, then evil wins instantly. If it's a villain, then that villain will take out one of the possible recruitable heroes on the bottom row of the game, taking them out permanently, and some of them also have little effects that will cause you extra trouble if they get there as well. Sometimes villains might have ambush abilities that cause extra wrinkles for the players, or gadgets might enter play that heroes have to recover from the villains by defeating them. There's also a bunch of scheme twists and master strikes, both of which pertain to the particular scenario you're playing and show the mastermind getting their hands dirty or shaking players off the trail. Once you've seen whatever bad stuff the mastermind is planning, it's time to take action. And this is where you play cards from your hand to generate attack or recruit points in turn. Recruit points will let you recruit new heroes from Q Branch. So for example, I could pay three points to take Tilly Masterson and put her in my discard pile, ready to be cycled back into my deck later on. These attack points, and sometimes recruit points, can also be used to defeat villains and complete missions. If you defeat a villain, then you add it to your score pile along with any gadgets they had on them. And if it's a mission, then you not only score it, but gain the success effect listed on the card. It's important to mention here that whilst this is a co-op game, you can play it a little bit competitively if you want, because all these points are going to be totaled at the end of the game, and the player with the most wins a little bit more than the rest of you. Of course, you can play it purely cooperatively. The main goal is just to win, and you want to take these cards out anyway, lest their bad effects happen to your team. Once you finish your turn, you will discard down your cards and pass on to the next player, and they'll take their turn until the game ends. But at some point, you're probably going to want to try and win. And the way that you do that is by fighting the mastermind themselves. Whenever you choose to fight them, you reveal what horrible tactic he's got planned, and that's what you have to beat to progress. There's four tactics under each mastermind, and when you get through all of them, you win the game. However, if you're taking too long to beat that mastermind, you might come across the inevitable card right at the bottom of the deck. And this card is going to be a real pain. It's going to be impossible to get rid of, and the mastermind is going to try and use it to escape, making you lose. You've got to finish quickly before the mastermind gets away. And that's basically the entire game. The complexity rises from the hundreds of cards that are contained within this box, and the ways that you can remix and mess with your standard James Bond formula. And the masterminds and schemes all have unique twists triggered by certain cards in these decks, so each game is going to feel a bit fresh and a bit weird. And that is Legendary, a James Bond deck building game brought to you by Upper Deck and designed by Danny Mandel and Ben Chichoski. And that's all for this preview. Thank you very much. Next up, we have a bonkers little thing from designer Ryan Miller and published by Upper Deck. This is Aliens Bug Hunt, an official, the second, the second official Aliens game in this uh, roundup of pre, well, in all of our roundups of preview videos. This is a lot lighter than Gale Force 9's uh, Aliens Colonial Marine, no, Aliens Another Glorious Day in the Core. Aliens Bug Hunt is lighter, simpler, and uh, as you'd guess from the small box, a little more schlocky, and as you'd guess from the tremendous amount of dice, uh, it's a lot more dicey as well. Um, before we start though, I want to just show you what this game looks like to unbox because it's one of the most exquisitely odd and exciting packages uh, to open up that I've seen in some time. Uh, but let's not get distracted. Um, I'm going to teach you roughly how to play the game and I'm going to start by mentioning this game has four manuals, not because it's complicated, but because it likes to divvy up uh, the upkeep of the game, the setup of the game, and even teaching the game to the four different roles of Intel Sergeant, Communication Specialist, Platoon Leader, and Master Sergeant. Uh, each of which uh, will say, okay, one player is gonna tell you to do this, you're gonna do this, you're gonna be responsible for this. Uh, so I thought that was quite cute, although it was interesting learning the game myself, and essentially having to bounce between four different rule books. But that's my fault for being a loner. Uh, what we've got here is a game of charging into a complex, shooting aliens and completing objectives, and hopefully getting back out in one piece. Uh, between two to four players, well I suppose, I'm not sure, can you play it with one? 
I'll leave that for the internet to decide. I'm going to receive these uh, player boards and by default in the regular difficulty everyone has two grunts and one special character with better stats and special rules. Um, but what's cute is that these characters you've got can slide up and down. They start ready but then as you use them they can become depleted and then you need to spend your turn reloading to bring them back. I just thought that was really neat and satisfying. Frankly, this uh, Aliens bug hunt is full of all kinds of neat tactile stuff. But as to how you play, it's very, very simple. Um, so to begin with, we would actually do a little bit of preemptive alien setup. Uh, we have these motion tracker cards that show kind of where you populate dice on this board. This kind of shows the dimensions of uh, the bug hunt we've got going on here. It's gonna be a maximum of five tiles sort of tall. We're all gonna enter from the APC size in the middle and it can be six tiles deep. So we've got this five by six sort of grid that we can fill out as we run around trying to complete our objectives. Um, how turns work is dictated by the phase deck. So we're gonna see who goes first. It's gonna be red. Uh, so Red's gonna take their turn, and all turns are super simple. Red will just have movement and then do one action. With movement, you get three movement points, but your movement immediately stops if you enter a space like so. Um, if you uh, want to move into a space that does not have a tile, that's the end of your movement, you just move in. If it has an objective token, we're gonna pop an objective token on that for us to claim. And if it has aliens, we're gonna put the dice down, and again, ergonomics! Uh, the aliens in this game are represented by the same dice you have to roll to kill them. So we've got two aliens and an objective in here, and Red's there. So because Red probably doesn't want to be alone with some aliens, Red might spend uh, their action. You could collect the objective. I believe it may or may not be a problem that there are aliens there. You can breach one of the barriers that make it harder to leave certain tiles. Uh, you can reload your characters, but we're just going to shoot. So it's red. Red has three ready characters. There's two dice to roll, so I only need to deplete one of my grunts because they have uh, two sort of bullet icons each. You can deplete as many characters as you want to roll that many dice. But since there are two aliens here, I can only roll at the maximum of two dice, so I'll deplete one grunt. I'll roll those dice, and ah! Oh, double blanks! Every blank that I get means that alien is dead. So that's gone. Walked in there, shot some aliens. What an easy game. Uh, well, let me show you some of the other ways that it could have gone. So it looks like four of these spaces on the dice are blank, so you can reliably expect to kill aliens. But one, there's a miss, and one is a damage in which uh, the aliens will uh, hurt you as a result of you trying to kill them. Um, you can also shoot, uh, let's imagine that uh, we had a wider sort of spread of aliens here. If you have a variety of aliens that are uh, in adjacent spaces next to you, you can shoot in your spaces and in adjacent spaces as well. But shooting in aliens in your space is more dangerous because uh, the red icon means that you take a wound as opposed to the red icon just means, I believe, they walk towards you and charge into your space. Um, wounds are also pretty cool and pretty, again, ergonomic. That's a word I've been using a lot to describe this game. Every time you take a wound, like let's imagine I rolled these dice and got some red symbols on the aliens that were in my space, the character that shot is gonna grab some of these tokens, which it's very important that you keep face up. And uh, that was what, two wounds? So you put two markers on that character. Um, when you're, you're gonna keep taking wounds up to the value of your armor rating on a particular card, um, and you're gonna assign wounds to whoever was shooting. So if you wanna shoot with your cool character, they may get shot more often. They may get hurt by aliens rather. As you take more wounds beyond your limit, so this person has four armor and he's had four wounds, if that character takes another wound, rather than taking another token, you flip one of your tokens face up and ah! Killed in action! Um, because you see half of these tokens are blank and half say KIA. So you can take four wounds, by default I suppose, on the grants, and then they could potentially take five more wounds before dying if you flipped over the four you had, they were all blank then only the next wound token you got would kill you. Um, but in my case, I got unlucky, you flipped a KIA and that grunt is dead, making me worse at shooting because, you know, you can use all these cards, you can deplete them, but when you spend your turn taking a reload action, they all pop back up to the top. Um, so how do you win, you might be asking, as we're running around shooting aliens and potentially getting shot? Uh, well, 
when you take your action to collect any of the objective tokens you find, you pass that to the player who is in charge of the objectives, and they can put that token on any one of the three mission cards that you received at the start of the game. Incidentally, Aliens Bug Hunt has a big old deck of mission cards and a big old deck of characters from the Aliens movies. So there's some randomized setup involved here as well. There's also some different difficulty settings. There's very easy ways to make this game harder or easier. Um, but we're getting distracted. Once you receive an objective token, the player in charge of the objectives can put that on any one of your three objectives. But each of these objectives represents a special buff. Every objective you receive uh, has a unique rule. And by placing objective tokens on that card, you're also unlocking sort of uses of that ability. And you can use it, uh, well, it says when you can use it, and you'll just flip over your objective token that's on that to show you are still progressing towards completing the objective, um, but you've used that token for its power. So that is really the game. It is as simple as that. You're going to be using the phase deck to determine who should go. It's, so in our randomized setup, it would be red takes a turn, then yellow takes a turn, then, <gasps> then the aliens spawn and, and do alien things, and then red takes a turn, and then green takes a turn. So between the dice and the cards and the random tiles you're drawing to build out uh, the map, there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of randomness, which is obviously what you want in a goofy, dice-chucking, shooty game that comes in a neat little small box. I think this is cool. I like so much of what it does to um, simplify the rules, to make learning it fun, and it's, this, it's hard to, for me to see any component in this game that isn't being used in a way that's just a little cleverer than it could be, you know, that isn't doubling up as one thing and another thing. So that is Aliens Bug Hunt uh, from Upper Deck, a game which I did not know what to expect from the box, but uh, continually made me smile for the entire duration that I was learning it.